Okay, so um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what I think about when I think about persuasion. Um, as a creative person, I'm going to sort of delve into a couple of pieces of work that I've done in the last couple of years that have been particularly difficult, I guess, to persuade the clients to go through with um, and just talk about how we got there. So, uh, first thing I would say, it's all down to relationships. Actually, the best thing about persuasion is if you have a really great relationship, it shouldn't be about persuasion at all. It should be about a shared goal. It should be about kind of focusing on that amazing piece of insight that means that everyone is pulling behind it. And actually, you can go so far, sell much braver work, do much more exciting things if you've got that relationship and you've got that understanding and the trust and you've developed that up front. So I'd say that is like number one, the one goal of kind of any person working in this industry is be your clients, like mate, confidant, close enough to be able to argue with them, close enough to be able to say like you're talking a load of bollocks, close enough for them to be able to say your piece of work is boring. You know, that relationship is absolutely, absolutely the most important thing. Um, but I've got kind of three key points, I guess, that I wanted to talk about in terms of three pieces of work. And the first one is don't be afraid of the right answer. So very often we get given a brief and the brief might have a particular shape to it or it might have a, I don't know, sort of a particular thing that the client wants to achieve. Spend that time as planners to kind of pull that away and actually understand what the real issue behind the brand is. As you said, it might not be price. It might be actually wanting to feel like a really great mom when you go on holiday. But make sure that you're finding that right answer and make sure that you stick with it. Um, the piece of work that I'm going to show, actually, it's a work that I did for, that we did for Bacardi. <clears throat> it's a couple of years old. Um, but it's honestly the, I guess, the bravest piece of work we've ever done, the most challenging piece of work personally that I've ever done. Um, and the brief from the client is, we're throwing a party in the Bermuda Triangle um, at Halloween, we've spent eight million pounds on it. We've got Kendrick Lamar, Ellie Goulding, and Calvin Harris playing over three nights. Brilliant idea, we're gonna invite like 2,000 influencers to come along because we figure with 2,000 influencers, you'll be able to get this amazing global reach for the brand. Can you come and do the social media and uh, you know, interview the influencers and do all that kind of stuff? We could have said yes, it was like quite a nice gig, get to go to Bermuda, etc. <clears throat> But really, when we sort of pulled back and thought about things from an audience perspective, so it's for Bacardi. Bacardi is drunk by like middle American young men who are never, ever, ever going to be cool enough to go to a party like this. And like, what is worse than watching a whole bunch of shit in your feeds about a party that you're not cool enough to go to? So we pulled our client aside, and luckily we built that relationship first. And we said, you know, yes, we can go, and yes, we can interview people, and yes, we can do all of this stuff, fine. We really honestly don't think it's the right way to go about it. We need to find someone that can speak from our audience's point of view. <clears throat> so we found an amazing guy called Marcus Haney. He's a famous festival gate crasher. He's broken into Glastonbury, and the Emmys, and the Grammys, and um, Coachella. And he does it like with quite a lot of style and he has a whole bunch of friends who break in with him, one of whom's in a wheelchair and like kind of gets him under the fence and what have you, you know, in costumes and this and that. And he just made a movie for MTV and we, in the budget, um, they had one tweet from Ellie Goulding. So we, we were able to craft a tweet from Ellie Goulding for the entire thing. And we thought rather than getting her to tweet about, isn't this party cool? What if we get her to challenge him to break into this festival? Um, this meant kind of giving away creative control. He's an artist, he had to do this properly. It meant no one on the island was notified. There was the Puerto Rican army guarding this island because of all the celebs. <laughs> no one was allowed to know. Um, only it was our client and the agency and Marcus knew what was happening. Ellie sent the tweet out and I'll play you a little bit of the film to show you what happened. If you could play the film.
As you can see, he turned up dressed as her. Um, his best friend was dressed as her boyfriend at the time, Dougie. Um, they broke in. The, the story is amazing, but what was more amazing is, you know, that could have been a series of like really boring social posts. And yes, we had to do some of those on the side. But what we ended up with was a 24 minute ready to air on MTV film to sell back to MTV in the States. The client, you know, basically allowed us to do this was still so nervous that he actually they don't own any of the rights to that it's that like co-owned by mr president and marcus haney because it was really you know it's quite a scary thing to figure out or to to try to figure out kind of what might happen so you know we had um at one point he was planning to jump out of a plane with his friend in the wheelchair and land on this beach and there were like two thousand basically drunk famous people on this beach and we tried to tell him absolutely he couldn't do it and he was basically you know an american style going like fuck you i'm gonna do whatever you want and so we were having to write ndas like on the beat and that's the other thing actually about taking pressure off your client you know we kind of protected him from all of this stuff that was going on we protected him from the fact that we got delivered 68 hours of footage and we had to edit it all ourselves you know we protected him from uh you know all the kind of sort of the legal shit that uh, could have happened um and that, you know, that resulted in a really great piece of work. So um, for, for that, I would say, you know, find the right problem. The right problem is that those young guys are never going to be excited by what the client has briefed us. So let's do the thing that will really get him excited. I can see someone that worked on it at the back there. Hey. Um, the next one is when you reach an impasse, reach for a shared uh, voice or voices for validation. Don't accept no. So. I'm going to show you a piece of work which has been incredibly, incredibly, incredibly successful. Um, it's got amazing results. Creatively, it's been incredible for us um, and for the client. But it has been a real struggle. And the real struggle is along something as simple as this line. To come out for LGBT, it's the Stonewall campaign. It's their first campaign in 10 years. It came out uh, towards the end of last year. This took us so many rounds of testing um, and it took us probably about eight months to get to and the reason it took us eight months to get to is this campaign is about activating the broad population the allies the people that are broadly supportive of lgbt rights and don't do anything it's not to activate or uh, put your arms around the lgbt community as such now the really interesting thing <clears throat> You know, obviously the Stonewall are 180 people working in the organization, all of whom have had very personal experiences and sometimes traumatic experiences of being LGBT. The words come out for someone that is struggling or isn't able to come out or has had a terrible experience are very, very provocative. And so we knew through all the work that we'd done, all the testing we'd done, all the rigor we'd done, all the millions of ideas that we've done, that this was the thing that was going to mobilize allies. It was understandable. It's understandable it's about LGBT issues. You really understand what it is that you're asking someone to do. But the client absolutely just could not see that that was the case and was incredibly nervous about everything, about you know even things like the full stop at the end here, which we spent weeks having a discussion over the full stop. But we really knew it was the right thing. Um, and when we couldn't come to a decision or we, we, we had an impasse and they kept on saying we will not do this, but like, we won't buy this piece of work, you have to go again. We just kept on presenting it, but we presented it with different points of view. So we did more testing and we listened to more people and we actually got some really interesting kind of third party people from outside the community to come in and be our advocates. You know, say this is the audience, this is the audience we've agreed on this is what's going to move them and you need to listen to them because you can't listen to us and we're, no, you know, we're not going to get anywhere otherwise. And what's, what it's turned into is a really very powerful campaign. And actually the power of the line has been great, a great piece of persuasion in itself. So um, one of the things that was very key to us was to talk to marginalised 
groups or groups that you wouldn't normally expect to support LGBT issues. So people like the army, that's, um, I always want to call him Colonel Sanders, but his name's General Sanders. He's the third most uh, powerful, uh, like, uh, powerful uh, man in the uh, uh, UK army um, with one of his gay sergeants. You know, he donated his time. We were able to persuade him to come down and give his time because of that power of the idea. Um, this is Ryan. He is the first openly gay FA ref. So we actually helped him come out. But, you know, to be able to get these people down and actually contributing and and to the campaign has was, has been really phenomenal. I'm going to play you the film. And the amazing thing about the film is everyone there has contributed. Like we, I guess, as an agency, created this film out of nothing. So. Um, we worked with a, a production company called Pretty Bird, who are amazing. They donated all their time, all their equipment, their director for free. The Mill did all the post-production for free. Wave gave us all the music for free. Um, the entire piece of work was made for absolutely no money because of the power of the idea. And uh, you know, I guess that's what I wanted to say about the persuasion. If you've got a really strong idea, you can bring people along with you. If you could play the video. So that for them was a really big deal. You know, it's a nice piece of film, but it's a really big deal for them. Uh, thirdly, lastly, um, once you've got uh, like a big connected idea, everything becomes a lot easier. I think, as, as you said, yeah, it means that you can make sense of kind of the crazy things that you might, um, you might kind of suggest if you've got a really, really clear, really insightful, interesting proposition. So we work for Crown Estates. Um, and actually, the piece of work we're doing at the moment is placemaking St. James. So that is building um, a world for St. James in a way that doesn't exist at the moment. So you know what Mayfair stands, like, stands for. You know what Covent Gun stands for. Probably King's Cross now, because I've been doing a lot of placemaking. You understand what King's Cross is about. St. James, you can't even figure out where the borders are. It doesn't really mean anything. And so when they are going to prospective shops, when they're going to retailers, when they're going to prospective kind of business owners or or you know, residential folk, um, they need to have something to stand for. And so we developed a really great, strong proposition for them called One of a Kind. Now, One of a Kind is something that operates entirely through their business. So it means that now when they speak to retailers, say, I don't know, um, uh, next wanted to come into St. James, they go, well, you could have a next, but it has to be a one-of-a-kind next. So how are you going to make that retailer one-of-a-kind? You've got Ollie and Steen there. Ollie and Steen there do different things to all the other Ollie and Steens because it's one-of-a-kind. And that's allowed us some really interesting creative freedom, um, which has uh, ended up most recently, actually. We do uh, their magazine, their local magazine called The Correspondent. And for the one-of-a-kind uh, last month, we developed a one-of-a-kind fragrance with Floris. The fragrance is um, developed from all the smells around St. James. So you've got the amazing kind of shoe shops and you've got the tea shops and you've got you know, all this, the tailors and the, the kind of the dirty streets and the gentleman's club and the tobacco. And you know, actually to be able to create that scent and then spray it across the magazines is lovely. But we wouldn't have been able to get there had we not had a really, really, really strong proposition that was stretchy enough to allow us to play. So. Finally, I guess with great creativity comes great responsibility. Those relationships are key. You can be massively exciting and creative, but you also have the responsibility for your client's business. Um, and if you can prove to them that you put their business first, it's not about awards and it's not about you know, frivolity. It's about actually delivering them business value. Then uh, creativity flourishes and that relationship flourishes. So um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>